We are going to get started. Um, first of all, I want to welcome all of you to the LSC. Uh, my name is Anne Tamayo, and I'm a faculty member here. Uh, today we have a very prominent speaker with us, Hans Hugerborst. Uh, I have difficulties pronouncing his name. Um, and he's going to be talking about a very timely yet controversial topic, uh, accounting harmonization and global economic consequences. Now, uh, the event is going to be recorded and we hope to make it available in our web page. You can also follow the event in Twitter. And uh, the structure is uh, uh, Mr. Hoover Bost, who will be talking for 40 minutes and then we'll open the discussion to the public. Um, now, before I uh, pass it to him, I'm just going to say a little bit about uh, Zbayo. Uh, all of you know that he is the chairman of the ISB. He was appointed in July 2011. Um, he has had a very distinguished career. He started as a banker in the uh, National Bank of Washington, and then he moved back to the Netherlands. There, he served as a member and advisor of the Dutch uh, Parliament and also the Ministry of Finance. And then, between 1998 and 2007, he held several posts in the government, in the Dutch government, including the Minister of Finance. Um, he has also been the chairman of various uh, organizations in the financial and regulatory sector, including the IOSCO and the Dutch Financial Markets Supervisory Organization. Okay. Now, he's also very knowledgeable about the financial crisis, and as such, he was in a panel advising the FASB and ISB on those matters. Okay. So we, are, we have a great honor to welcome here to the LSE. Um, please join me in welcoming him to the LSE. Good evening, uh, everybody. It is great to be at this fantastic school. I hope to be sending my son here to study economics <laughs> two years from now. I have to start with a disclaimer. I am a very unlikely chair of the International Accounting Standards Board. Um, you just heard a little bit about uh, my career and you will understand that even after having done this job for one and a half years, accounting is still challenging to me. I am not a trained accountant. Instead, I read history at the University of Amsterdam before going on to study international relations at the Johns Hopkins University in uh, the United States. And after a brief spell working for a US bank, it has gone broke since, like many banks, <laughs> like too few banks. I saw the light and uh, I decided to commit myself to serving the public interest. And I returned to the Netherlands to uh, start a political career. I became first parliamentarian and then moved on to become minister at the departments of finance, social affairs and health. And in all those roles, in all those roles, I worked with my colleagues to reform the Dutch welfare state, which was a bit overblown. And it was a very rewarding period because we saw that the uh, uh, Dutch economy regains it, regained its former strength. If it can survive in the current turmoil, I don't know. But uh, we, dot, we did get a lot done. And after leaving politics, I spent several years as chairman of the Authority for the Financial Markets, which is a Dutch financial regulator. Uh, looks very much like the Financial Conduct Authority here in uh, the UK. And as I assumed my position just after the outbreak break of the financial crisis, that was a very challenging task, and that's putting it very mildly. And I have to tell you, after this long political career, I thought I had seen it all. But what I found in the financial sector, um, when I discovered how incredibly weak it was, I, I, I just couldn't believe my eyes. 
Uh, the AFM was also, my, this, this uh, supervisor, was also responsible for overseeing financial reporting. And it was my first exposure to financial reporting, and much to my surprise, I found it a very fascinating area. As the crisis started to unfold, many people in the financial industry started to blame accounting rules for the volatility in the financial system. And I found that, although I, didn't, I knew very little about accounting, I knew this was very suspicious criticism. It was a typical case of blaming the messenger. So I made the mistake of using a couple of speeches to speak out on this topic. And these speeches came to the attention of the IASB. And I was asked to co-lead an advisory group that advised the IASB and its US counterpart, the FESB, on their joint response, response to the financial crisis. And then, a few years later, I was asked to become chairman of the IASB, which I did in July 2011. The moral of this story is, of course, that you have to be very careful by what you say in speeches. <laughs> so why was I interested in chairing the ISB when I'm not a chartered accountant? And believe me, in the year that I, since I was appointed, I have asked, asked that question many times. Especially when we are in midway through a five-day board meeting discussing eight possible alternatives to accrete interest on the insurance liability or some other piece of accounting rocket science. And boy, can we make things complicated. But joking aside, the fact is that accounting really matters. David Tweedy, my uh, predecessor as chairman of the ISB, he used to say that the job of accounting is to keep capitalism honest. And I could not agree more. In our public capital markets, many people are working with other people's money. And the relationship between the investor and the investee is usually very anonymous. And this relationship is highly based on trust in economic standards, markets and institutions. And I believe that the financial crisis has demonstrated brutally how incredibly weak the checks and balances in the public markets can be. The banking system was allowed to get horribly risky and leveraged on the back of implicit and explicit state guarantees. We are truly living in the biggest credit bubble in history, and five years after the outbreak of the crisis, a global economic catastrophe is still a very real possibility. And I also believe that the many excesses in corporate remuneration are also indicative of the poor way that investors' interests are in represented in public capital markets. Since executive pay is often linked to earnings, corporate management has an enormous interest in accounting rules that allows them to present those earnings in a favorable way, that allows them to massage earning fi earnings figures. And many breakthroughs in accounting were hard-won victories over vested interests. And I will give you a couple of examples later in my speech. And you will understand, you will start to understand during my speech why even accounting is political and why they asked a former politician to lead the IASB. It takes a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> Let me now turn to the relationship between the globalization of the world economy and the surge in the use of the standards as produced by the IASB. In the world of financial reporting, the most startling development of the last 10 years has been the decisions of most of the world's economies developed and emerging to embrace international financial reporting standards, or IFRSs as we call them, as issued by my organization, the IASB. <coughs> 
There are many reasons why this happened, but the main one is that has been the globally interconnected nature of today's financial markets. Capital no longer respects national borders. Investors seek diversification and opportunities on a global basis. Multinational corporations want to maintain one set of books across all their international activities. And regulators and policymakers want a level playing field for financial reporting. The good news is that in 10 years, we made remarkable progress. From pretty much a standing start in 2001, we now have more than 100 countries using IFRSs, including more than two-thirds of the G20. Half of all Fortune Global 500 companies now report using IFRSs. And to understand the scale of this achievement, just look at Europe. In 2002, the European Union decided to switch to IFRS from 2005. The 25 member states at that time had less than three years to prepare. And on the 1st of January 2005, around 8,000 companies simultaneously switched from more than 20 different national accounting regimes to IFRS as to our standards. And that was truly a very remarkable achievement. And where Europe led, others have followed. Look at an IFRS map of the world and you will see that all of South America is now on board. Mexico and Canada in North America. We just have this small country in between. It is still, you know, it doesn't make up its mind. We have the Caribbean. We have Australasia. Big parts of Asia. Most of Africa and, of course, Europe, including non-EU countries such as Russia and Turkey. And that is quite remarkable progress in little more than 10 years. In my view, the momentum for IFRS becoming global standards has now become unstoppable. It can still be slowed down. It is going to be slowed down probably a little bit uh, these days. But it, I don't think it can be stopped in the end. Of course, I already small, uh, mentioned that small country between Mexico and uh, Canada. We cannot overlook that the United States still has to make up its mind whether and how to adopt IFRS. As the world's largest national economy, we would obviously very much like the U.S. to be a fully paid-up member of the IFRS community. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, it has been a long-term supporter of our work. The SEC has already determined that IFRS is of high quality and it permits its use by non-US companies listed on US markets. That is no mean feat. It is estimated that over 500 companies, many of which are European, are now listed in the United States not using US GAAP but using IFRSs. The SEC had intended to make a decision on IFRS during 2011 but they announced in July that it would postpone this decision. I think it had something to do with a little event taking place later, or right now, and of which we will see the results later today. We hope that uh, 2013 will bring better news. For the call uh, of the G20 for a single set of global accounting standards to remain credible, and in every press release of the G20, they, they are... Uh, calling for um, uh, adoption of a single set of uh, global standards. For this call to remain credible, it is very important that progress is made soon. The second question that I would like to discuss is why financial reporting can be so controversial. There are several reasons for this. It is fair to say that we do not always help ourselves. Many say that the extensive disclosure requirements of both U.S. GAAP and IFRS, that they need some pruning, that they are too extensive. And sometimes our standards do not make a lot of sense. For example, in the past and still now, we allowed banks that have suffered a ratings downgrade to recognize a gain 
due to a decrease in the market value of their own debt. So you make a mint out of your, the, the uh, decrease in your uh, credit worthiness. We politely describe this as counterintuitive. And in each of these cases, we have either fixed the problem, this, this, this problem of own credit, we have already fixed, it's just up to the Europeans to adopt the standard. Um, if we haven't fixed it yet, we are in the process of doing so. But of course, you can understand that examples like this cause irritation. In many areas, controversy, more importantly, in many areas, controversy looms because we are trying to shine light into some dark corners of the financial system. There are some historic examples of that. For example, the expensing of stock options and getting pension liabilities on the balance sheet. Believe me, they were not on the balance sheet in the past. A current example is the battle to bring leases on the balance sheet. Some time ago, the ISB and the FASB had the mother of all bat battles against vested interest to record the granting of stock options as an expense. Up to then, company, companies could grant those options at seemingly no cost, while these stock options obviously diluted the holdings of existing shareholders. There was a huge, a huge lobbying campaign led in part by the technology sector to keep it that way. But there was one question that this lobby could never answer. If, the, if these stock options really cost nothing, why not give them to everybody? And even legendary US investor Warren Buffett waded into this ferocious debate to um, promote uh, change. He uh, wrote in his famous uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual report in 1998 the following, I quote, a distressing number of both CEOs and auditors have in recent years bitterly fought FESB's attempts to replace option fiction with truth and virtually none have spoken out in support of the FESB. Its opponents even enlisted Congress in the fight, pushing the case that inflated figures were in the national interest. More than $70 million was spent lobbying the US Congress and other policymakers that the end of the world was nigh. But on that occasion, finally, the standard setters won. It was the ISB, I'm really proud of that, the ISB that led the way, paving the way for the FESB to follow suit. And almost 10 years later, very few people questioned the logic of recording stock options as an expense it is simply regarded as a good business practice. And the same is true with pensions and other post-employment benefits. Many years ago, companies were able to keep off the balance sheet information related to these liabilities. And as is often the case, what is not measured is not managed. As a result, the management of some companies were able to literally give away the value of the company without shareholders knowing anything about it. At the time, bringing pensions liabilities on the balance sheet was hugely controversial. And to some degree, it still is. However, such liabilities are now routinely discussed in the boardroom and with investors. And this is especially true as many pension schemes are in trouble and the company is on the hook if things go wrong. Today, we have a similar battle with leasing. The vast majority of lease contracts are not recorded on the balance sheet, even though they usually contain a heavy element of financing. For many companies, such as airlines and railway companies, the off-balance sheet financing numbers can be quite substantial. What's more, the companies providing the financing are more often than not banks or subsidiaries of banks. <laughs> if this financing were in the form of a loan to purchase the asset, it would show up in your books as a loan. Um, call it a lease, and miraculously, it does not show up in your books. In my book, if it looks like a duck, it swims like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. 
So is the case with debt, leasing or otherwise. Right now, most analysts they have to take an educated guess on what the real but hidden leverage of leasing is by using the basic information that is disclosed and then they usually apply a rule of thumb multiple, they take the lease and then multiply it by seven or something and then they put it on a, as a liability on the balance sheet in their own makeup of the balance sheet. And it's of course altered that you have to expect an analyst to guess the liabilities associated with leases when management really has this information at its fingertips. And that is why it's extremely urgent that we come up with this standard. Companies tend to love off-balance sheet financing as it masks the true extent of their leverage. And many of those that make extensive use of leasing for this purpose are not happy with our intentions. Furthermore, the leasing industry itself is fighting its own lobby. Members of the U.S. Congress, Congress, heavily lobbied by the industry, are writing letters to our colleagues at the FASB. A recent report in the United States claimed that our joint efforts with the FASB to record leases on the balance sheet will lead to a job loss of 190,000 jobs in the U.S. alone. And I seem to remember similar claims being made when the ISB and the FASB required stock options to be expensed. That would have also been the end of the world. We should not be surprised by this lobbying. The SEC predicted it would happen. In June 2005, the SEC submitted a report to Congress regarding the use of off-balance sheet arrangements. This is around the Enron time. Arguing for a change in lease accounting, the report said, and I quote, the fact that lease structuring based on the accounting guidance has become so prevalent will likely mean that there will be strong resistance to significant changes to the leasing guidance. Both from preparers who have become accustomed to designing leases that achieve various reporting goals, not economic goals, but reporting goals, and from other parties that assist those uh, preparers. These words uh, turned out to be quite prophetic. As the financial crisis was caused by excessive leverage, our efforts to shed light on hidden leverage should be warmly, warmed welcomely, sure, should be warmly welcomed around the world. The fact is that we are still facing an uphill battle. And we will need all the help we can get to ensure that we do not get lobbied, of course. We need national accounting standard setters, regulators such as the SEC, investors and others to stand by their beliefs and help us to bring much needed transparency to this important area. We really need their vocal support to counter what is a well-funded and well-resourced lobbying campaign. Thus far I've told you about the public interest of accounting and the reasons why it tends to be controversial. The third reason why I think accounting is fun, yes it can be fun, is the fact that it is intellectually challenging. It's interesting. Basically, accounting is an economic science. That means that it is not completely a science. It means that just like economics, it is as much an art as a science. No offense meant in this August building. Like other forms of economic science, there is a lot of judgment that goes into preparing financial statements. Accounting has the same problems as its sibling economics. You need math to exercise it, but do not expect outcomes with mathematical precision. For example, accounting has multiple ways of measuring the same asset or liability, depending on the business model according to which it is held. The measurement of intangible assets is fraught with difficulty such as how to value the brand of an acquired company. The application of professional judgments is an essential characteristic of financial reporting. But we should also not forget that in many cases, judgment is little more than an educated guess. 
And that is why we intend to devote a lot of time revising our conceptual framework. The conceptual framework is, framework is the theoretical foundation of our standards. It deals with very basic questions such as what is an asset? What is the difference between a liability and equity? How do we measure income? Seemingly very simple questions, but I assure you that we can make the answers very difficult. We already have a framework that works reasonably well. However, areas such as measurement are still less than perfect, and then am I putting it very mildly? It is easy to understand why this is the case. After all, measurement is the most judgmental, difficult, and politicized part of accounting. And we need to bring more rigor and clarity there, but it will be an extremely arduous task that will require a lot of brain power and courage. Whatever the outcome, it is most unlikely to receive universal acclaim. Can you imagine a group of the world's leading economists sitting together to create the conceptual framework of macroeconomics? The only certain outcome would be bitter fights, bruised egos, and no framework. And the Nobel Prize for economics would automatically follow, fall to the sole surviving economist. <laughs> Since accountants are very polite human beings, I am sure that we will manage to keep it civilized but universal praise we will not get. Ladies and gentlemen, it has indeed been a pleasure to share my thoughts with you today. To summarize, I do believe that IFRSs will become global standards. I also believe that standard setters will continue to remain unpopular because change is rather, is seldomly popular, even if it's change for the better. There are just too many people that profit from status quo. Thank you for your time. And given the fact that this is the London School of Economics, I am looking forward to some really challenging questions. And please do not disappoint me. Thank you. So now we are going to open it to the public. There will be a microphone uh, circulating. Before you ask your question, if you can say your name and your affiliation, please. Uh. Oh, yeah. uh, Misha Klamesh, uh, Gigi Press. I'm a, a journalist. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, you were talking um, about risk, and obviously there's a massive problem with how we measure risk and collateralise debt obligations when the ratings agencies like Fitch, Standard & Poor, and Moody's were um, uh, the, um, rating... CDOs, which were really junk, AAA, um, and that stuff. So we have to have things regulated. But then um, we also have to have you know, this problem of liquidity and, and lending and getting money into the system. And we seem to have a now problem in the UK where, on the one hand, we want banks to you know, restructure their balance sheets, but also small businesses have a real problem you know, just getting money because they, they simply don't, we don't have the credit history. So, so how do you get the balance between you know, just measuring risk properly because surely there's always going to be risk in the financial system because in, in, there will always have to be, surely being part of a bank is making sort of bad loans. I mean, some businesses will go bust, some loans will go bad. And if you never made a loan on the fact that it's too risky, it's like you wouldn't cross the road, um, you know, because you think that you get hit by a car every time. So there's, so where's, how do you, what's the right level of risk? Well, if you look back on the period preceding the crisis, and you look back and you just look at the normal numbers that accounting produced at the time. Suppose you look back at RBS uh, just before it took over uh, ABN AMRO, a bank from my, uh, my country. Then you could have seen that RBS had no capital. It was leveraged 40, 50 times over. And the little capital it had was mostly goodwill resulting from previous taking, takeovers, which was intangible. It really had no money in the bank. And basically in the Western world, we had offended or trespassed all the normal rules 
of economic prudence that existed in previous times. I said before this was the biggest credit bubble in history. It is unbelievable that we allow this to happen. And no accounting rule or whatever can, I mean, even with the uh, standards that we had at the time, uh, it could have been seen if it had been looked upon uh, with a realistic eye. What went wrong is that we had uh, prudential rules, the Basel uh, ratios, uh, which allowed banks to not look at their balance sheet as it was, but to risk weight the assets that they had. They were allowed to assign uh, a zero risk to sovereign debt. They still are. I think by now I, would, I wouldn't even vouch for sovereign debt of the Netherlands, which is triple A still. It's not risk-free. Nothing is risk-free. They were allowed to subtract sovereign debt from their balance sheet for prudential regulation, and for, by these, uh, by these uh, rules, uh, this very, suppose they had 1.5% of, cap, of real capital, it miraculously became 5% or 10% by these rules. So it seemed like something. That is something that the, 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 the very fact was that the most elementary rules of uh, how to protect yourselves against excessive risk taking, they were all broached. Did accounting play a role? Should accounting have done things differently? A little bit. Um, especially in the United States, it was too easy for banks to keep their assets off balance sheets in these so-called special purpose vehicles which were full of those CDOs. They were allowed to put them on a, at an accounting distance uh, when, and, and they, they were not on their balance sheet. The minute the crisis broke out, it was clear that they had to support those CDOs and they came back to the balance sheet. Uh, we have time to tightened up our consolidation rules, especially in the United States, that was very much uh, needed. Also, um, the accounting rules that tell banks when to recognize their losses, uh, it was too, it, what we have still now is the so-called incurred loss model, and it allowed banks to procrastinate too much and to keep loans on the books while they were pretty sure that they were going bad. And that is also something that we are changing now. We are going from an incurred loss model to an expected loss model. Very difficult because it's very subjective, uh, but it will be a, a step forward uh, because we uh, will uh, not allow uh, banks to procrastinate as much as they do, as they do now. Um, but, you know, your basic, your question is, on the one hand, we need stricter rules. I think I made that clear. But banks are also, because of these stricter rules, are not able to lend money to small and medium-sized companies at this moment. And that is exactly the rot that we are in. Uh, on the one hand, there's no alternative to really elevate the uh, uh, liquidity requirements and solvency requirements of the banks because they were outrageously uh, low. Uh, on the other hand, we have these economic problems. You have to deleverage in a time when the economy is doing very badly. I think there is simply no way out. That is why I also said that it is still uh, five years after the beginning of the crisis it is still possible that we are heading for an economic catastrophe. Uh, there is so much debt in the system that it is highly, uh, uh, it can be doubted whether it can be paid back. Um, and you see that countries that are undertaking heroic efforts to pay back, uh, that they get into such economic malaise like uh, Spain that it becomes very difficult for them. It's a clear sign that debt is too high. Thank you very much, I'm Zia uh, Risk Management student at the London School of Business and Finance. Um, my question is about, um, it's obvious that if, you, if the US GAAP and IFRS at some day merge, it will, the accounts will become harmonized. My question is, when you consider new accounting standards, to what extent uh, you are fine making it 
similar to U.S. CAP, or and and this second part of the question is when they consider new standards, to what extent they are fine making it similar to your standards? I mean, I, 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 I'm just wondering if there is a yeah. if there will be one day that this to if U.S. either adopts IFRS or Europe uh, adopts U.S. CAP, there will be harmonized accounting standards. That is my point. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, very good question. Um, what we did in the last decade was that we had a project of convergence between the ISB and the FSB. We took a, quite a few uh, important standards and tried to make them look alike as much as possible. And we're still working on three standards, uh, revenue recognition, leases, uh, and financial instruments. Um, I can tell you this is very difficult work. Um, I always say, you know, I have a board of 15 independently, independent thinking uh, board members. If I would cut my board in half, and sometimes you're tempted to do so, uh, I would have two different opinions. Uh, and working with two boards uh, around the world is ve it's very difficult to get everybody on the same page. Nevertheless, we made a lot of progress in the last couple of years. Uh, a couple of standards really became much closer. And the idea was, if we, we came close enough, it would be easier for the United States to make the final decision to adopt our standards. We have now reached the end of uh, convergence, and it's becoming more and more difficult, especially in the last couple of months when it became clear that the Americans were not really about to take that decision. It would became more and more difficult to get common answers. So in the end, you have to make up your mind. You can't keep, we, we, we can't keep on converging. Uh, the United States will have to decide what, what they want to do. And of course, the wise answer would be that they adopt our standards. Richard? Uh, Richard McVee from uh, LSE. Thanks very much. Very interesting speech indeed. You said right at the beginning that you were appointed because you're better at politics than accounting. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would summarize the politics of the ISB in the first decade as primarily focused on A, the US, and B, Europe. And at least one standard had to be changed to suit the president of France. What do you, without giving too many hostages to fortune, what are your political problems going to be in the next 10 years now that your constituency is so much wider and includes what's predicted to be the biggest economy in the world in yeah. 10 years' time? Well, first of all, they did not hire me because they thought I was better at politics than accounting. Uh, they had high hopes that I would be, would be able to pick it up quickly, and I'm doing my best. <laughs> uh, secondly... Um, my challenge, our challenge as um, a global organization is that we have to make everybody equally unhappy. <laughs> uh, obviously, it will be very rare that we come up with a standard that, uh, where everybody says, yes, that's what we like. We have to take everybody's opinion into account. We have, a li have to listen very carefully to what the possible effects of a standard can have in different parts of the world, and ultimately we have to make up our mind. And, um, of course, we will not do it in such a way that we give a, a, a little bit of, uh, that we, everybody gets a little bit of a piece of the action, so to say. That's not the way it can work. Uh, sometimes you will take a decision that really pleases the United States but really irritates the, uh, the European Union. Sometimes it will be the other way around. Ultimately, that's why it's very important that we are an independent board. Ultimately, we have to do what we think is right. And obviously, we also, we also will have to take... You have to be aware that you cannot always get what is the 100% perfect answer. With leases, we have made some changes to make it easier for people to work with, to take away a little bit of the objections, and we keep our eyes on the main goal to get the stuff on the balance sheet. Uh, so you have to be pragmatic, uh, but at the same time, you have to, always to, you have to keep your, your goal in, in, in... That's also how I always worked in politics. You always have to set a main goal, uh, be pragmatic in the execution uh, of a policy or in the, in the formulation of a standard, but the main goal should be attained. 
and uh, then we cannot uh, be too lenient uh, to uh, political considerations. Uh, David Green, um, you've talked um, very much about the role of the preparer as an investor in, in, in the world of accounting. There's also the role of the auditors. Yes. Now, of course, you aren't responsible for um, the standards or indeed the oversight of auditors, but this is a world you know quite a bit about. And I wonder whether you would like to say anything about what you think about the auditing world viewed from the, um, your present perspective? Yes. I, David Green also, uh, always asks very difficult questions. Um, it is, um, before I became uh, chairman of the, um, uh, of the ISB as, as, as a securities regulator, I did give a speech in which I said, I just told you about the balance sheet of the banks, how poorly they were designed and how, uh, if you really looked at them, it was pretty clear that they were close to bankruptcy. Why was there no auditor who raised his finger and raised the issue of going concern? Um, to defend the auditors, I would say, obviously, they relied on the prudential supervisors doing their job. And they probably thought as long as they don't kick and scream, why should I? Uh, and I really hope that in the future they will play a more active role themselves. And that uh, obviously it's very difficult for an auditor to raise the red flag in public and say this bank is going about to be, about to go bankrupt. But you would expect them to run to the regulator and uh, tell the regulator that they think there's something really fishy going on. Um, the auditor is, has a very difficult position, which is difficult to solve. Uh, they are being paid by the preparers, uh, but they are expected to check the, uh, the preparer, to control the preparer, and verify their work. Um, and that can be a very difficult uh, position, because obviously the auditors also have their financial interests. Uh, they, want, they, have to, they want to make a decent, and sometimes uh, more than a decent living. Um, but... Um, um, at the, at the other, on the other hand, they have to check these companies. And that can put them in a very difficult, uh, in a very difficult position. I think that uh, there is now so much pressure on the auditing profession uh, that uh, they have to show more independence. And I think rightly so, that they cannot escape becoming a little bit more uh, independent and courageous in the future. Otherwise, the whole business model is going to be at stake. There is no easy solution. You could, you know, you could replace them by civil servants, for example, who are independent of the companies. Is that going to work? I really wonder. We had independent civil servants supervising the banks. Did that really work? Not very well. So there, this is one of those issues that have no easy answers. But I really think... Uh, um, I think overall these are people uh, the, with an honorable profession and uh, I, I would say overall with a uh, pretty high work ethic uh, and they really have to do something. And I think they realize that. Yeah, please. Thank you. Vicky Wood from the Department for Business Innovation and Skills. I'm interested in what you were saying about the Convergence Project and how we move forward. Um, one of the arguments that's being put forward is that part of the difficulty is the US approach to um, financial statements is one of um, providing information to future investors and that in Europe um, our historic approach has been for accounts to provide information to the existing owners of the business, the shareholders. And I wonder to what extent uh, you think that is an issue or has been an issue and for whom do you actually think uh, accounts are prepared? Yeah. 
to tell you the truth, I think it should not even matter that much for whom you do the work. Our job is to per give as honest and reliable and fair and accurate portrayal of the financial state of a company as possible. And it shouldn't matter too much who is looking at those figures, whether they are investors or shareholders, shareholders and investors are one and the same thing, whether they are preparers or managers or regulators or depositors, uh, it shouldn't make all that much difference. Having said that, it is obvious that our most important client is the investor. He is putting his money on the line. He needs protection. Uh, and he needs to have these reliable numbers. Uh, and that is, uh, our mission has no difference with the mission of the FESB. We put the investor first, but as, as I said, I think the public interest of good accounting is much larger than the investor itself. So for, it's a public interest for society as a whole. If investors cannot trust the numbers, the fabric of our economy falls apart and everybody suffers. So uh, that's why uh, our public interest is much wider than that of investors only. Hi, Nigel Slay Johnson from ICAW. Hans, there's a, there's a growing body of evidence that indicates that realizing the potential benefits of IFRS depends crucially on the institutional and regulatory and human capital environment in particular jurisdictions. Does the, does the IFRS Foundation have any role to play in fostering improvements in the institutional context in those jurisdictions? Um, first of all, I completely agree with your uh, uh, statement. Uh, it is true that I mean, it's fine to have fantastic standards, but if you don't have a profession to uh, execute them, uh, you, know, you have a bit of a problem. And there are uh, large uh, parts of the world uh, where uh, the profession is new and still growing and uh, uh, they need help. We give help, but we can only do so in a limited fashion. We have a rather, we, I think we are one of the cheapest global uh, organizations in the world. We're small, we only have 120 people working for us. Um, uh, so obviously we cannot go all around the world helping uh, local uh, people to uh, implement our standards. Uh, we do give conferences, uh, sometimes we uh, train uh, professionals. I went to, a, uh, to a, a big conference in Brazil where there were about 4,000, no I shouldn't exaggerate, about 2,000 professionals being trained and we did our small part there. Um, but we have to work together with national standard setters, local authorities, uh, but we do what we can. I think the, most that, the best that we can do is to create clear standards that are easily understandable, which, which is quite a challenge because economic reality is very complicated and you often get very complicated, uh, complicated uh, standards. But this is about what we do. Richard Feilonghu from AOI. Um, you just mentioned that uh, significant efforts has been put in the establish establishment of new framework, but I have seen um, a very strong detachment from standard setting process and the process of uh, setting framework, and there are a few inconsistencies between um, the standards and framework. So, in, and it appears to me that um, the setting of uh, um, conceptual framework is more of a philosophical argument instead of a pragmatic issue. So would you please comment on this detachment? Thank you. Yeah, you uh, point your finger at a very painful issue, of course, uh, which is that we are not always consistent. We're not the only ones in the world, but it is true that uh, sometimes standards deviate from the conceptual framework. Uh, that is often for pragmatic reasons uh, the fact that if you try to do something conceptually completely pure, it's impractical, impractical in, in, in practice. Sometimes there may also be so much pressure in the world to do things just a little bit different uh, that uh, we were not able to get the uh, right conceptual answer. Uh, so yes, it does happen. Uh, also in the future, uh, the, the revision of the conceptual framework 
we will um, make it clear that uh, the conceptual framework will give a lot of guidance, but in that in particular cases, standards might deviate a, a bit. Obviously, for the credibility of the conceptual framework, uh, this deviation cannot be uh, too big. And it is very important to have it, uh, since we are a principle, our standards are principle-based. That means that we try not to get too detailed, although there is still a lot of detail there, if you look at our uh, books. Hmm? Um, but we try not to get too detailed, and it means that we do not answer all the questions. And then sometimes it is very good for preparers or, or um, investors that to be able to look into the conceptual framework, what is the sense of direction that we get from that. So it's very important work, and it will give us a, quite a few difficult challenges. We, by the way, we will do it by not just looking at what is theoretically right, but also by testing it with our standards. And the conclusion might very well be that we may have to change standards in the future. If we get a conceptual framework which is better, uh, we might have to conclude, well, in our existing standards, there are quite a few problems. Um, then we will not say immediately we're going to fix them all, because it takes a lot of time and people are a bit fed up with us. They, we have created so many new standards in the last couple of years, everybody's tired, so they are asking for a period of calm. Um, so we will not immediately uh, start repairing all the, uh, all the standards, uh, but it will be very important work which uh, hopefully will give us a clearer sense of direction. It's not that we are lacking one, but it can always be better. Anna Simpson from LSE. Um, to what extent are the findings of academic research taken into account when uh, making decisions on new standards or amending existing standards? Well, when we like the outcome, we use them very much. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, we just um, uh, wrote a response to the uh, SEC report, on, uh, which basically led to a non-decision of the uh, SEC. Uh, they didn't have a cost-benefit analysis about the implementation of IFRS, so we thought we'd do it ourselves. And we asked an academician to do a literature study, study of all the uh, research that has been done about the benefits of uh, IFRS, and there were, there were quite a few benefits. So we made a good summary and, 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 and produced it as an appendix to, to our response. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, uh, for example, we are now doing a, a post-implementation review about segment reporting, which is a very contentious issue. We changed that, and uh, a lot of people didn't like it. And we are using academic research to see what the effects have been. Unfortunately, we're doing it a little bit soon, and a lot of, there's not, still, still not a lot of academic research available. But be assured, uh, rest assured, it is being read. Uh, we follow it closely. Uh, we have had academicians uh, on the board, uh, Mary Barth, uh, for example, from the United States, really good acad academician. Uh, and uh, as you can see, I like to have c contact with the ac academic uh, community, and, and so do the other board members. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Levine, and I'm from the University of Hertfordshire. My question is, the IFRSs provide users with, or supposedly provide users with useful information. With the multitude of measurement techniques that are available to them, do you believe that, to what extent do you believe this is true? To, to, to what extent is what true? That investors are provided with useful information? Well, sometimes I'm a bit skeptical about that myself, but I was at a, um, a big conference in the United States of institutional investors, and all the big institutional investors were there. There were about 1,000 people in the, um, in the room, and they were giving a multiple choice uh, question, which is how essential do you think that financial accounting standards are to your work as an analyst or as an investor? And uh, there were five possibilities from not at all to very uh, essential. And uh, I actually 
thought the outcome, outcome would be somewhere in the middle. But the outcome was that 90% said it is very essential. It is not as if analysts usually come up with their own numbers and uh, EBITDA and stuff like that, which is not in our, uh, in, in our standards. We call that non-gap measures. Uh, so they use it all over the place. But why do they need their, our standards? Because they, 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 are, they give rigor, uh, they apply to everybody, and they give comparability. They give a firm basis. And there is uh, actually uh, one sector in the economy where we do not have a good standard yet, which is insurance. We don't have a good insurance standard, actually none at all. And basically the insurance industry does what it wants you would say, well, everybody happy. Now, they are very unhappy because the investor does not chain, trust their numbers and they demand an extra premium uh, for the capital that they provide. So that really goes to show how essential it is to have these uh, accounting standards. Nia, prospective student in LSE. Uh, here I have a question following on the auditing issue. Uh, I once worked in the finance department in a Fortune 500 company, and when the auditor came to me, asked me some question about the figures, I just told them this uh, management issue, like this is our estimation, this is how we do it last year, this is what we always do. They just leave and very satisfied. So I was wondering, like, uh, what, when, why there are some problems with auditing firms? I think partly because of the dependence on our paying them the fees, but there are other reasons like actually they don't understand the company much. They don't have such information as much as we did in finance department. So my question is, uh, what do you see in the long run where accounting regulation go? Would it be very scientific removing all these management measurement let the auditors know exactly what happens. Or in the end, we can just go so far, let it just be a management issue. Let the managers explain what happened. They just stand out of the door. So this is my question. Yeah. Well, your, um, your statement makes clear that what we just, just discussed about the audit profession, that that is very urgent, and that they become more critical and more independent uh, towards uh, management. Um, it also makes clear that um, our standards have to be firm as well and that they don't allow for playing around too much. And one of the reasons why I think this leasing standard is so incredibly important because now management can do what it want, wants with it. Uh, and that should not be, uh, that should not be uh, uh, the case. Um, I would also hope that management does realize that um, playing around with the numbers or masking problems, that in the end you always get punished. Uh, the problem, of course, with, um, uh, with uh, markets is that the punishment can come very late and uh, that by the time management may have left, including its bonuses. Um, and, you know, I, I really think that investors should do much more to de-link uh, earnings from uh, short-term performance. That is such a poison in the public markets. And uh, that will have to change. Uh, and then it becomes also easier for management to confront issues. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um. Uh, thanks, I'm Andrew Leonard. You've sort of touched on this subject in your answer to the last question, but um, I was um, noting that the K report has recently made a case for investors to become involved. Uh, by taking a longer term view and by engaging with the company rather than necessarily being fixated on uh, simply valuation of uh, shares and securities and exercising what influence they have by simply buying and selling shares in the market. Um, and he talks about earnings and the way he puts it is that companies should seek to disengage themselves from the earnings game. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered whether this sort of strain of thought 
um, was something that you saw as relevant to your work going forward? Well, obviously, we are not in the position. I, I can state my opinion, as such as I just did now, but we are not in a position to change this. And I mentioned it in my, in my speech as well. I believe it's very important that this happens, but uh, that's not our job. Our, what we can contribute is to make it more and more difficult for management to play around with the earnings. That's our job. And that is, I think, the biggest contribution that we can make and uh, a very important uh, uh, contribution to uh, the public interest uh, uh, in uh, public capital, capital markets, which uh, unfortunately has been severely damaged in the, in the last couple of years, but even long before that. Well, thank you very much. Um, please uh, join me in thanking our speaker.